Yeah, look, this is why I'm such a big fan of yours on Twitter. <laughs> I, I'd love to be a fan of you on a platform that is not owned by Elon, Mu Elon Musk. I know, so, me too. so you should tell me where that is. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but you like cut right to the heart of it. Hello, and welcome to the Politics Girl podcast. I'm your host, Lee McGowan. Let's get into it. Today's pod is the last before the holidays, and I think it's only appropriate for an American political podcast to end the year talking about democracy. With that in mind, today's pod is a candid conversation with democracy's white knight, Mark Elias. Mark is an American attorney and the founder of the Elias Law Group, a mission-driven firm dedicated to helping Democrats win, citizens vote, and progressives make change. Mark served as general counsel for Hillary Clinton and John Kerry's presidential campaign, and it was Mark who oversaw the state-by-state -state response to all the Trump campaign lawsuits contesting the presidential election in 2020, which he won all but one minor case, which was later overturned in his favor. It is Mark and the Elias Law Group who, as Republicans and their allies turn their attention to using litigation as a weapon against democracy, have been at the front lines fighting back. In order to keep the American public up to date on these legal issues and fights going on around the country, Mark founded Democracy Docket, the leading progressive media platform designed to provide information, opinion, and analysis about voting rights, elections, redistricting, and democracy. As the website says, you can't fight voter suppression unless you know it's happening. Mark is an absolute superstar who believes, as I do, that the fight for democracy is the fight of our time. So without further ado, please welcome my guest. Democratic lawyer, famous legal expert, and champion for democracy, Mark Elias. Welcome, Mark. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you for joining me. I am so happy to be speaking with you. You've done so much to protect and fight for democracy throughout your career, but particularly in the past couple of years, as it's been under near constant attack. And there's so many things that I would love to talk to you about, so many things I should be thanking you for. I mean, thank you for suing to keep the polls open on Saturday in the Georgia runoff. You know, because of your team's work, 70,000 Georgians were able to cast a ballot that day. You know, thank you for suing Pennsylvania's election board for failing to certify the election. Thank you for winning all your cases in the 2020 Trump election loss temper tantrum. I honestly feel I can't open up Twitter or read the news or go through your amazing newsletter from Democracy Docket and not think... God, my God, thank goodness for Mark Elias. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for everything you do. I, 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 I see you on Twitter. You're in your kitchen. There's the refrigerator. I try to read, like I try to squint and see, like, is there real stuff? And it's like, yeah, no, no, that's really, that's like really her and really her refrigerator. <laughs> It's so true. There's like a food list from the my son's school or there's a list of things money can't buy because I have to keep reminding myself of that. That's all my real life. Well, that's that's what this is all about, right? The fight for democracy is not an abstraction, right? It's how we're not here to like save some really old piece of parchment with writing. We're here to make a difference in people's lives. And when you have a functioning democracy, you have a functioning government, it helps solve the problems that everyday Americans face in just living their lives. Exactly. Exactly. It's why I fight for it every single day. And I say all the time here on the show, thank you for caring enough about democracy to be here, because yeah. I think that's really what it comes down to. So you wrote in September that Republicans have really turned their attention to using litigation as an offensive weapon in voter suppression efforts around the country. You know, they are financed by a bunch of well-funded right-wing organizations. Republicans have dramatically expanded the number of cases they're filing in order to restrict voting rules and undermine elections. And I say all the time, the Republicans have realized that they can no longer win on ideas or on candidates. So instead of changing their unpopular policies or picking better representatives, they're doubling down on making sure their opponents can't win by engaging in this kind of multi-pronged attack on democracy itself. So do you want to talk to me a little bit about that using litigation as a weapon? Yeah. So I, first of all, I think you got it exactly right, right? We're in this place because Republicans are no longer a majoritarian party. And this is really, really, really an important concept that people need to realize. You go back and you look at Ronald Reagan or George Bush the first or George Bush the second, they talked about mandates. Remember that? Mandates. And they talked about the silent majority and they talked about, you know, the importance of these sort of big, big coalitions. And they don't do that anymore. They now view their goal as to win elections 
with the understanding that more people will vote for the other person, right? So they want to try to figure out the way in which they can win the outcome of elections, even though they don't have majoritarian support. And one of the ways they do that is by changing the rules, right? They change the rules by by passing new laws that target black, brown, and young voters. They they um, they make it, the administration of elections more difficult for people to navigate those systems. But this year, what we saw is that they also use the courts uh, to try to shape the election rules and to try to shape the experience that people have, real everyday Americans have at the polls, try to shape that experience so that they would make it less favorable for black, brown, and young voters and women, and more favorable for older white male voters. Yeah. I mean, if you can't win based on the rules, change the rules, right? That's kind of the idea. Yeah, and it is. And we have a we have a lack of understanding, I think, in too many places that the rules matter. Right. So if you look at if you look at, for example, absentee voting, what you see is that if you are older, you're more likely to have your absentee ballot count than if you're younger. If you're white, it's more likely to count than if you're black. If you're male, it's more likely to count than if you're female. It's literally a system that benefits old white men. And the same is true at in-person voting. Think about in your head about an image of people waiting in line to vote. Inevitably, that image is of either young people or black people, because the only people who wait in line in this country are either young or black. And that's why when you see a state change its laws, for example, to restrict uh, ballot drop boxes, what is restricting ballot drop boxes do? It makes more people vote in person. When more people vote in person, there are longer lines. When they say no food and water for people in lines, what are they really doing? They're penalizing people who are going to have to wait longer in lines, which are inevitably uh, black voters or young voters. Yeah, it's just one thing after another to make it more hard, more difficult or more miserable to vote, right? These yeah. these lawsuits the Republicans are filing are pushing for things like you said, um, you know, that end up having closing polling stations so the lines are longer, voter purges, challenging the results of elections, banning drop boxes, overturning no excuse mail-in ballots, uh, attacking signature matching rules. One lawsuit in North Carolina wanted to overturn a rule that regulated the conduct of partisan poll watchers. It's just like you were saying, just one thing after another. It no longer seems good enough just to use redistricting to manage who can vote. Now they want to limit which votes count, which is why they're suing to empower partisan poll watchers and limit county officials from allowing voters to fix things like simple errors on a mail-in ballot to ensure that their vote is actually counted. So it's not just voter suppression, it's election subversion. Absolutely right. Absolutely yeah. right. It is It is not just who can vote, it's whose ballot ultimately counts. Right. And we have an epidemic in this country already in the best of times of uncounted ballots, people who try to do everything right, but because the system is confusing, because they've got a million other things going on in their lives, they don't get it exactly right. And what Republicans are trying to do is make that more and more complicated for voters and more and more unforgiving for voters. Yeah. You were just writing about Brad Raffensperger, the Georgia Secretary of State, who recently called to end general election runoffs, which is hilarious because we just had a runoff election. And you pointed out that he was perfectly fine when the GOP was using them to disenfranchise black voters. And then he supported shortening the time period when he thought that would help the GOP win. But now that Warnock has won, he wants them gone. So this isn't about making sure everyone's vote is counted. This is about using the courts and new laws to make sure you can discount a number of votes to keep winning, even though you don't have the majority. Yeah, it's really, it's worthwhile your audience doing a little bit of research. Just Google the history of runoff elections. Why do we have a runoff election for Senate in the in Georgia, right? You you live in a state California, that, yeah. okay, I wasn't going to say, but California, <laughs> you live in California. There's no, there's no runoffs in California for Senate. There's no runoffs in New York for California. Uh, for Senate or in Michigan or in Wisconsin or, or, you know, New Hampshire, right? Why do we have it in Georgia? Well, if you look at the history, we have it in Georgia. It's a relic from the Jim Crow era. It was, it was put in place as a way to make it harder for black voters to elect their candidate choice. And it worked. I mean, the fact is uh, before the 2021 election, 
where Warnock and Ossoff won in those runoffs following 2020, uh, you had seen Senate uh, Democratic uh, Senate candidates lose runoff elections in every two years, at least going back to the early 90s, maybe even earlier, but but at least going back to the early 90s. And then in 2021, after the 2020 election, you saw Ossoff and Warnock win. So what did the Republicans do? Did they say, you know what, we no longer want runoffs? They said, no, you know what our problem is? Our problem is that we gave too much time for those candidates to to stage and prepare voters and educate voters for a runoff in in, um, January. So let's cut it back and let's do that runoff right after Thanksgiving in December. That'll that'll do it. And then when it didn't do it, here we are. They want to do away with runoff elections. Look, we ought to do away with runoff elections. Like they were racist to begin with. They they have they have they are bad policy. But it tells you something about how how Republicans think about it. You know, what's his reason for wanting to do away with runoffs? He said, well, it really burdens the county election officials. Well, didn't it burden the county election officials a year ago? Yeah. Right. And 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 here we are. Yeah, no, it's more like all these working people are still finding a way to come out and vote the second time, and that's not going to work for us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we all know that the Republicans tried to use the court to undermine the 2020 election. And even though that failed, thanks to you and to those god-awful cases and their terrible lawyers, they were, however, able to use those lawsuits to legitimize their falsified idea of a stolen or unfair election and then spread that disinformation around to galvanize their base that basically just undermined our faith in the entire election system. I mean, the whole thing feels gross to me because they've tied up election subversion with the bow of election integrity, right? They keep saying something is wrong with the election system and we're just trying to fix it. But when they lose their lawsuits that should prove that nothing was wrong or they're actually trying to break it rather than fix it, they use that loss to claim that it's only further proof that the system is rigged and That's why they are right in the first place. It's sort of a lose-lose for people's faith in democracy. Yeah, look, this is why I'm such a big fan of yours on Twitter. (laughs) I'd love to be a fan of you on a platform that is not owned by Elon Elon Musk. So so you should tell me where that is. (laughs) But, (laughs) but, But you like cut right to the heart of it. Right. Like you just like cut right to the heart of it. You're exactly right. I mean, they they use the fact that they got thrown out of court, not as a point that they were wrong, but somehow in a perverse way as a point that they were being victimized. Like it it helps perpetuate the notion of victimhood. Yeah. I mean, you recently wrote on Democracy Docket that Republicans see the court as their next point of attack in this ongoing war in democracy. So when a state refuses their anti-voting agenda, the GOP take their wish list of limiting mail-in voting or politicizing election administrations or subverting elections to the courts, either at the state or the federal, right? And it feels to me like, and tell me if I'm wrong, but it feels to me like this is what I ha- they had in mind when people like Mitch McConnell were willing to make a million concessions to back Donald Trump. You know, the whole idea was in order to pack conservative judges, many of them completely unfit for their job, onto the federal bench because they're looking at the courts themselves to uphold their power rather than trying to convince people to vote for them anymore. You know, the Republicans, spearheaded by Leonard Leo and the Federalist Society, have focused on packing the courts for decades. I mean, it's been a long-term plan. This is very strategic and actually very clever if if you aren't, you know, if you're looking at it strategically. But then it makes you wonder, like, how many Justice Eileen Cannons are out there? You know, justices that not only have no business with a lifetime appointment on a federal court, but are actively working as operatives for the Republican Party or anti-democratic forces. Yeah, look, I think, again, you put your finger on it. Um, One of the most sort of frustrating things is that you ask Democrats, you know, what do you want to get done in Congress? Like, what do you want right. to get done in Congress? What do you want to get done in government? And it's like, well, we have to tackle immigration. We have to tackle climate. We have to tackle women's health. We need to do more about CHIP and we need to do more about Social Security. And yes, Republicans, it's judges. What else? Judges. What else? Judges. Right. Like their whole mission, Mitch McConnell's whole mission, as you say, like is just judges after judges after judges. And like that's, as you say, a decade long strategy that they've been engaged in. I mean, like what what legislation, if Mitch McConnell was in charge of the Senate, like what legislation does he want? 
Like there's nothing built. Like it's not like he's like, oh, you know, we really need to improve people's <laughs> lives by doing X. They just judges. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's they don't even have a formal party platform anymore. They just right. abandoned it. They were like <laughs> They literally did a, <laughs> Who needs that? <laughs> what do you stand for? I don't know, nothing. Yeah, just moving on, you know? <laughs> Um, so there's obviously a lot going on, but you recently tweeted out that this is a big week for democracy in court. And I would love to hear what you think the most important legal cases are for democracy right now. I mean, obviously I'm thinking of more V Harper, but I also know that failed Republican candidates, Carrie Lake and Abraham Hamada and Mark Fincham and Jeff Zink, they've all filed lawsuits challenging the outcomes of their elections in Arizona. And for people who don't know, these are the losing candidates for governor, attorney general, secretary of state, and the third congressional district. Do you have a take on what's going on there other than it's just a sore loser convention? So it is definitely a sore loser convention. And you have, you know, crazy followed by crazier followed by craziest in terms of the the lawsuits they are filing right? right this is like this is like Kerry Lake is like how can i replicate Donald Trump one more way i know <laughs> we'll file really nutty lawsuits um i do have a question which i realize like i'm here to answer the questions but like <laughs> there is something weirdly unique about arizona like what yeah. the hell I like know. why is that like why is it just in arizona that we that we see this yeah, heat. <laughs> well, you're in Southern California, so I thought you might know. <laughs> We've got a little more temperate here, Mark. It gets a little cooler here. Maybe the, the heat gets to your brain there. I'm not quite sure. I mean, I think there's a reason the RNC is involved in any of these lawsuits in Arizona, right? I mean, they're just kind of letting these candidates like Carrie Lake, who, like you said, is basically demanding she either be declared the winner or they give her an entirely new rerun of the election. But the RNC seems to be letting her swing in the wind. What's your thought yeah, on that? It's really, right, it's really interesting. So um, this is like very much inside baseball, but I find it really fascinating. So <laughs> the the lawyer who was like all in with like Kerry Lake, Harmeet Dillon, um, MAGA lawyer, she was like all in with Kerry Lake. She is now not representing Carrie Lake in this contest, right? She's running for RNC chair oh. and is like, okay, I must not have time <laughs> to to be part of this. Yeah, she's got to she's got to take on Rona and my pillow. So <laughs> right, exactly. it's a big race, <laughs> right? So 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 Lake is represented by the by the lawyers who did the um, cyber ninjas, oh, right? And then real winners, yeah. And then Fincham. <laughs> Fincham couldn't even get the cyber lawyers, cyber ninja lawyers. He got the lawyers that when Cochise County, Arizona, tried to hire the cyber ninja lawyers and they were like, no, no, not doing it. They went to another law firm. That's who Fincham got. So it's actually, <laughs> it's uh, it's interesting to see um, uh, how they are lining up on their side. Uh, and I, you know, obviously I think this all goes nowhere. And in some ways, you know, like we were saying, it's easy to make fun of. Uh, and to poke holes in, but it feeds, it's going to feed this, like this conspiracy narrative, the narrative. on the other side. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's something in the long run for democracy is really dangerous. Totally dangerous. Absolutely dangerous. Cause it just undermines the entire system. I mean, most of these people said they were going to do this before anyway. They were like, if I don't win, it's cause it's rigged, you know, this whole concept. Right. And don't you worry that like, I'm not, I'm not saying that the lawsuits in 2020 or the outcome of the lawsuits directly led to January 6th. But at some point you lie to your voters and you lie to them about what the courts, right? The courts are usually an outlet that like let off the steam. Like people feel like, okay, I got my day in court. You know what I mean? Like I didn't like that, but I got my day in court. And, and like Trump didn't let the courts play that role. He continued to feed this agreement. And then you have people who become violent. And I just worry not so much about this Arizona thing specifically, but just more generally that as Republicans keep lying to people, eventually they feel like, well, the system is so rigged against us, they have no other choice. And that's why I say it's really dangerous in the end. It's deeply dangerous because like you said, your day in court used to be a pop-off valve. And now the day in court doesn't count as that. So what you're doing is building up pressure within a system where people feel that they have no recourse. And when people feel they have no recourse, that's when violence happens. Exactly. 
So I've been talking about Athletic Greens for over a year now. If you've listened to the podcast for that long, or if you're new to the podcast, please know I don't take on advertisers I don't believe in. And AG1 not only has been a supporter from the very beginning, but it's an absolutely quality product that I can truly stand behind. My family takes it. My 80-year-old dad takes it. My friends take it. It's one of those things that will actually change how you physically feel. With just one scoop in water every morning on an empty stomach, your body gets 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help start your day off right. Their special blend of ingredients support your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging. Basically, all the things. And you might be thinking, but I already take a multivitamin. Is it really that different? Yes, it really is. It's important to choose supplements with high quality ingredients that your body can actually absorb. Athletic Greens uses the best of the best products based in the latest science, and it's constantly changing the product's iteration based on third-party testing to make sure you're getting the very best version. There's a reason Athletic Greens has over 7,000 five-star reviews, is recommended by professional athletes, and trusted by leading health experts. AG1 is a micro habit with big benefits, and it's something you can do every day and know you're taking care of yourself. Do you wanna feel good over the holidays and into the new year? Do you want someone in your life to feel better, have more energy, or sleep better? Then now is the time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you one free year of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash politicsgirl. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash politicsgirl to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate in daily nutrition. I honestly wouldn't keep talking about this if I didn't truly believe in it. Give the gift of health this holiday season at athleticgreens.com. Our next sponsor is Bombas. Bombas makes gifting easy with socks, underwear, and t-shirts that not only feel good, but do good. Because with every item you purchase, Bombas donates another item to someone in need. And I know I sound crazy suggesting the most basic of basics are a good gift, but I'm not steering you wrong. Socks aren't a bad gift, you just weren't getting the right socks. My family has been wearing Bombas for years. I didn't start using them when they sponsored the show. Our drawers were already filled with their products. And every holiday, we restock. We have their short socks, their medium socks, athletic socks, snowboard socks, hiking socks. My husband is now wearing compression socks. Bombas uses top shelf materials like premium cotton and ultra soft, never itchy merino wool in their socks and t-shirts and fuzzy Sherpa linings in their slippers. And did you know that socks, t-shirts, and underwear are the three most requested items from homeless shelters? Well, Bombas did, which is why Bombas donates one for every item you buy. So if you buy a t-shirt, someone in a homeless shelter gets a t-shirt. You buy some socks and someone in need gets some socks. And that's not just lip service. Bombas has already donated over 75 million items of clothing. That's a whole lot of comfort and a whole bunch of good. So give the gift of good this holiday season with Bombas. Go to bombast.com slash politicsgirl and use the code politicsgirl for 20% off your first purchase. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash politicsgirl, code politicsgirl for 20% off. It's easy to talk about these products when you truly love them. Find out for yourself at bombast.com slash politicsgirl, code politicsgirl. Okay, well, let's go back to the biggest case for democracy, I think, on the docket right now, which is more V. Harper. Do you mind if I sum it up quickly for those who don't understand it? I would love you to. Okay, and let me know if I get it wrong. Okay, so last year, North Carolina's Republican-dominated state legislature passed in a party-line vote this obscene partisan gerrymander to lock in a Republican supermajority of the state's 14 congressional seats. The gerrymander was so extreme, even if you took an evenly divided popular vote, would still end up giving 10 seats to the Republicans and four seats to the Democrats. So the map was considered so radical that it was deemed more favorable to Republicans than 99.999% of all other possible maps. So in February of this year, North Carolina Supreme Court struck down that gerrymandered map and they described it as egregious and intentionally partisan. And they said it was designed to enhance Republican performance. So what did the Republican state legislature do? They proposed a second gerrymandered map and they prompted the state court to basically be like, "Okay, look, stop trying to favor yourselves. We're going to designate a special master to create a fair map for the 2022 elections because apparently you guys can't do it. 
But the Republican legislature was unwilling to accept that outcome. So they asked the Supreme Court, which, by the way, had in a previous iteration already ruled that federal courts can't hear partisan gerrymander cases. They asked the Supreme Court to step in and reinstate the original gerrymandered map. And our current Supreme Court took up that case. But this is about more than just if the Republicans' state legislature's extreme partisan gerrymander gets to stand in North Carolina. This case is more about how that decision will affect the rest of the country and really how it comes down to how our democracy works in general. It's a really big deal. And I would love your take on what I think is a horrifying case. Yeah, no, you got it exactly right. And my... um my my firm represents Harper, uh, as in Moore v. Harper. Uh, we brought the we we were among the legal team that that brought the case, uh, and you got that exactly right. the The reason why it's it's so horrifying or threatening is because the what what the um, North Carolina legislature is saying is that a state supreme court cannot apply its own constitution to invalidate a law passed by the legislature. So if if there is a provision, just imagine for a second that there's a provision in a state constitution that says um, everyone in the state has a right to cast a ballot by absentee vote, okay? And the state legislature passes a law banning absentee voting. The legislature's position is the state courts can't apply the state constitution. That whatever's in your state constitution simply can't apply. The legislature can pass whatever laws it wants, and state courts are are stuck. They can't do anything about it. It does away with judicial review, uh, state court judicial review of state election laws in, that apply to federal elections. It is radical. It is anti-democracy. It violates separation of notions of separation of powers and the rules of courts. And the fact that the U.S. Supreme Court is even considering this case, as crazy and radical as this theory is, tells you a lot. The good news is the the justices in this Supreme Court seem skeptical that the state legislature's position was reasonable, but they seemed open to potentially a compromise theory. And that's what's going to that's where this is the rubber is going to meet the road. Right, right. I mean, it'll devil in the details and all that. But like, as I understand it, to win this case, you're Harper, right? Yeah. So for more to win this case, more, the justice- more is the Repu- more is the Republican state speaker of the House. Got yes, it. Speaker okay. of the House. So as I understand it, for, for more to win this case, the justices would basically have to accept a theory that pretty much exists in the far right fringes of academia. And this theory is called the independent state legislature theory, which pretty much, as you said, gives all power over federal elections to state legislatures and state legislatures alone to do whatever they want when it comes to voting. So you couldn't take anything to the court, not to a state court, not to a federal court. The governor couldn't veto anything. You could draw whatever map you wanted. You could make or remove rules as you liked. You could get rid of mail-in voting. You could get rid of secret ballot if you wanted to. You could even decide to overturn elections because you didn't particularly like the results. And when I say you, I mean the state legislature didn't particularly like the results. And the voters would have no legal recourse. So if the independent state legislature theory was adopted, it would essentially throw our entire elections into chaos because it would it would set a precedent that would nullify hundreds of election rules, ballot initiatives, state constitutions, administrative regulations. It would also mean that voters across the country had no remedy to fight back. So this is a it, it's such a big deal. And I think people sometimes think, well, North Carolina, that's not me. That's not my state. But it would affect you if this was what they ended up adopting. Yeah, I think so. Part of what makes this such a dangerous theory is that because it's never been adopted by any court anywhere, it's not entirely clear how broad its sweep is. So, for example, you mentioned governor's vetoes. Like, if legislature just means legislature, then it doesn't meet the governor's veto. But at argument, they they seem to be like, okay, we're okay with the governor. Well, part of that is, by the way, because in North Carolina, the governor can't veto uh, oh. uh, uh, the uh, the maps. So, like, they were like, okay, we're fine with that. Sure. Elsewhere. 
but so, but so like it's really unclear what its sweep is. But you know, I think it's fair to say that if the court adro- adopted a strong form of the independent state legislature theory, it would in one fell swoop invalidate more state constitutional provisions than any ruling in the history of this country. Yeah. I mean, there isn't a state in this country that doesn't have a clause that deals with elections because here's the kicker to get admitted into the union as a state you have to have a provision in your state constitution that guarantees free and fair elections but yet all of those provisions would now be essentially set aside for state legislatures right and this isn't at all what the founders intended is it i mean no no, no. i mean like in theory the framers kind of they were kind of nervous about state legislatures to run fair elections you know it kind of runs contrary to constitutional text and history and practice. I mean, I think the framers quite famously distrusted state lawmakers. So if you were an originalist, like the six far-right members of the court claim to be, the independent state legislature theory would not be within the framers' intent. You know, it's really interesting because originalism, for those folks that don't know, is a way of interpreting the Constitution that says, what did the original framers mean at the time they passed the amendment? And famously, conservative justices tend to be originalists and liberal justices tend to be less originalists. What's interesting is the originalist argument is clearly on the side of uh, of opposing independent state legislature doctrine. There's no question that at the founding of the Republic, when they passed when they passed the Constitution, they intended the courts to play the role that they play. Um, and the state of North Carolina, or I should say the Republican legislature in North Carolina, really doesn't make an originalist argument. Right. Uh, they make a textualist argument. They say this is what the text says. But most conservative jurisprudence ba- is based on originalism, which is what did the founders meet at the time? And um, they've abandoned originalism here. Hopefully the conservative justices won't abandon, abandon originalism and they will send this theory back to where it belongs. <laughs> the gutter? That'd be great. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I mean, Congress ultimately retains power to set the rules for federal elections. But the framers wouldn't have established, and quite frankly didn't establish, anything that would allow state legislatures to regulate federal elections without any checks and balances applied to state lawmaking. I mean, on top of that, the theory kind of makes no sense. I mean, why would a state legislature be allowed to violate their own state constitutions? And how could a court, even the Supreme Court, rule that other courts have no power? Right. This was this was I thought where Judge Jackson was like spot on in most states, maybe every state. I don't know. I haven't looked at all 50, but in virtually every state, the legislature is a creature of the state constitution. Right. You know, she kept asking the question, like, who decides what the legislature is? And the lawyers for North Carolina kind of didn't want to answer. But the truth is, it is the same constitutional text that says what the legislature is, what its powers are. So how could you then take away the state constitution that actually created it? I'll add one other thing, which I, you know just shows the dishonesty of the Republicans who brought this case. The law that passed the map that you mentioned they passed that got struck down right. actually called for judicial review. It was in the law. In the law, it said, this is how the state courts are to review this map. And then they reviewed the map under that procedure, including the special master, all of that. And then they said, oh, we didn't mean any of that part. Well, that was a legislative enactment. Well, it goes back to if you can't win by the rules, change the rules. (laughs) Yeah, they didn't think we were going to win. You know, people point to the North Carolina Supreme Court and they say, "Okay, well, didn't you have a majority of Democratic or progressive justices. But what they don't realize is that the three-judge trial court panel that actually chose the special masters, that actually adopted the map, was a right-leaning panel. And so I think they thought they were protected. Um, It's very similar to the other case that went to the Supreme Court this year uh, involving voting, which was out of Alabama involving the Voting Rights Act. We want Mm -hmm. my firm also brought that case and won that case. And it was two Trump appointees and a Reagan appointee who ruled in our favor. And so it discombobulated the state of Alabama. Like, wait a second. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I thought these were our boys, which is kind <laughs> right. of what you're saying about the case right now, because you've been watching. I mean, are they done with the deliberations on this? They're not done. Yeah, yet, we'll right? just wait. We'll get in. We'll we'll get a decision in June. 
But okay. the case has been argued and it's just, we're just waiting now. Yeah. And you said that the lawyer for uh, Moore seemed a little bit surprised that he wasn't getting more obvious support among the conservatives on the bench, you know, much like the guy who's paid the other fighter to go down in the fourth round and he doesn't. I mean, this didn't really go exactly as they planned. That's right. I, I think he was quite surprised that he got a very cool reception. And rather than sort of pivoting into where the court was, he kind of stayed in his original place, which, as I said, kind of made him a bystander in the end to the argument. He was not he was not speaking to the justices, even the the center right cons, uh, conservatives. Uh, he was not speaking to where they they were they were hearing the case. Right. He was just sticking to his absolutist position, which was yes. like they have full rights over everything with no recourse. Correct. Right. And I have to say again, I mean, the Supreme Court already rejected this idea in 2015. So the question would be, why was it taken up by the Supreme Court now? And to me, that's pretty obvious that it's the same reason Dobbs was brought to this particular court, right? Dobbs is the case that ended up overturning Roe and a pregnant person's uh, right to an abortion in America. But it seems that even if the facts in a case haven't changed, the justices have. And these new justices seem to be much more willing or people have the idea that they'd be much more willing to give a different verdict, even if the facts in the case haven't changed. Yeah. I mean, so a couple of things. First of all, with respect to this case, it's not just that there was a recent case. There was also several old cases. Right. So like this is neither a new principle of law nor an old principle of law. Like this has been, this has this question of, you know, the, the question of the veto, for example, was decided in a case called Smiley versus Holmes decades ago. You know, you mentioned the more recent case in 2015 out of Arizona. Like this has not been an unsettled area of law for a very long time. Right. Um, and, and Dobbs to me is, you know, what I say to folks all the time is whether, whether you are directly or not directly affected by Dobbs, everyone is affected by Dobbs. Because if the Supreme Court can decide to take away a fundamental right, then it can take away any fundamental right. Absolutely. And don't fool your don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself to think that your fundamental right is more protected than theirs. Once the court gets in the business of removing fundamental rights, then it can receive it can remove any fundamental right. And that's not just, by the way, contraception with um, Griswold versus Connecticut. It's the ability to teach your children a foreign language. Which was a case of which is which was a fundamental right that was determined uh, in I think the 1920s and the 1930s. It's all kinds of things that we assume that people have the right to do, and and the Supreme Court has started down a very dangerous road. Yes, they absolutely have. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons that their legitimacy is being called into question all the time. I mean, I think they're walking this really fine line between being activists and being justices, you know, like between how the three Trump justices found their way to the bench, between Clarence Thomas's wife and her insurrection drama and his refusal to recuse, Justice Alito's continuing problematic behavior and comments. I mean, how long do you think, and I've talked to other people about this, but how long do you think that we see this court as legitimate or we start seeing it for what I think it is, which is starting to become the right hand of the right wing? Look, I think that this is something that the court needs to worry a lot about. I don't know that they do. I don't know that they do. But, but the truth is that you know people um, people talk a lot about the um, Roosevelt's effort to pack the court, and they study it in, in that sort of narrow frame. Right. What happened in the 1930s is people just stopped paying attention to the court. Like literally, it was refusing to address the challenges faced by the um, by the Great Depression, and it was refusing to uh, allow the jurisprudence to meet the moment. And it was facing not just a packing problem, which was what people focus on, but people were just starting to pay to just not pay attention to the court. The court would rule something, and they'd be like, mm, "That's all well and good in Washington D.C. You think that, but out here in Minnesota, that's not a, that's not how we're going to do it." And so I think that you know that's not a good thing. That's a that's a breakdown of rule of law. But you know, there's there's a point at which you're going to tell people they don't have fundamental rights. And, you know, it's just not going to comport with the lived experience and the daily needs of the of the public. 
Exactly. You tell people that they and I think can't we're, get and I, by the way, yeah, and I think Republicans are facing that by the way right now in the reaction around um, reproductive health. Well, they should be. Yeah. Reap what you yeah. sow, baby. Are you spending the holidays with little people or do you have to buy a gift for little people this season? Do you want to connect with the children in your life or you don't know what to say to them, but you'd love to leave a wonderful memory of you as the funniest uncle or best granny or their parents' coolest friend? Well, then I have to tell you about this absolutely fantastic book called If You Laugh, I Am Starting This Book Over. It's one of those books that forces you out of your comfort zone and into the world of a child. It makes you silly. You kind of have to do the voices and get down with the spirit of the book. It's a way to facilitate real interaction that if you really do it will make you the hero of the holidays. I highly recommend you go to your local bookseller or to that big online one and pick yourself up If You Laugh, I'm Starting This Book Over by Chris Harris. Holidays are for memories, for family, for friends. And if we're being entirely honest, it's one of the most special time for children. So join the children in your life in one of their happiest memories and read them, If You Laugh, I Am Starting This Book Over. You will never regret taking the time. Winter is here. And for our family, that means struggling to find the right temperature when we sleep. Well, now there's a way to stay the perfect temperature all night long by using Silver Infused Bed Sheets by Miracle Brand. Did you know that your temperature has one of the greatest impacts on your sleep quality? If you're someone that finds themselves too hot, my husband, or too cold, me, I highly recommend that you check out Miracle Brand's bed sheets. Inspired by silver infused fabrics made by NASA, Miracle Brand makes temperature regulating bedding so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. And when you infuse a sheet with natural silver, it also prevents 99.9% .9 of bacterial growth, allowing your sheets to stay cleaner and fresher three times longer. That means less bacteria, less acne, less allergies, less stuffy noses. Miracle sheets are also luxurious and comfortable, but without the high price tag of other luxury brands. They offer a whole line of self-cleaning, eco-friendly bedding, including sheets, pillowcases, and comforters. So go to trymiracle.com slash politicsgirl to try it for yourself or give the perfect gift this holiday season. Miracle is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't completely satisfied, you will get a full refund. And right now, Miracle Brand is offering a special holiday deal for our listeners. Save over 40% when you use the promo code POLITICSGIRL at checkout, and they will send you three free towels. So upgrade your sleep with Miracle Brand. Go to trymiracle.com slash politicsgirl and use promo code POLITICSGIRL to claim your three-piece towel set and save 40% off your order. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash politicsgirl. Thank you, Miracle Brand, for sponsoring this episode. I mean, look, even if the anti-democratic forces don't win more v harper i think it's very clear that we need to note that they would like to win it you know this yeah. ability to overturn elections and ignore the will of the voter to create the kind of america they think we should have that republicans are willing to completely abandon our votes our democracy our fairness even to retain power and that feels obvious if you look at more v harper and the fact that it was even brought to the case in the first place but i think that's what we have to keep in our mind that this is what we're up against yeah and i think that you know people ask me about 2020 you know like what was the darkest point mm -hmm. and like i never thought we were going to lose any of the cases but the moment that that gave me the greatest concern was Texas filed a lawsuit directly in the Supreme Court to invalidate the votes in four states, literally to disenfranchise the voters of four states. And 17 Republican attorneys general signed on to that lawsuit. I remember. And I thought, oh, my God, like 17 states, Republican attorneys general thought. Yeah, top lawmakers in 17 states said, yep, that would be fine to overturn the will of the voter in these states. Throw out their votes. Throw out, like, be like those. Yeah, that's terrifying. And then a hundred and you know thirty some odd members of the Republican House Conference signed on to it. And you know, like, how do you have a democracy, a two party democracy, where one party is like their Not top for democracy. lawyers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. No, exactly. I mean, you recently tweeted that it's time for the Federal Election Commission themselves to start doing their job and defending themselves in court. What do you mean by that? 
Because you're doing Look, all the I defending think... right now, I, you and your team, which you always give <laughs> such credit to. I love you for that because you always give such credit. You're like, it's people like, let's just duplicate Mark. You're like, you don't need to duplicate and triplicate me. I've got this great <laughs> team. They're all working. It's all great. It's not just me by myself. And you always give credit to everybody else. But you said that the FEC needs to start defending themselves. So what did you mean? Look, I, I try to be very, um, first of all, it is a team. And and you're, mu- you're marvelous the, at it. Yeah, all the lawyers who work with me are are phenomenal, and they do they do the 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 Lord's work. I think it is everyone's responsibility in the federal government, in private practice, among big law firms that aren't doing enough. It is everyone's responsibility to step up their game, you know, and to be doing more because you know it's easy to be like, mm, let's just take a pass on this one. Because it's, uh, it's thorny, it's hard, it's something I don't want to get in the middle of. But um, you know, in the business community, I mean, where's the like? By the way, where is the business community? Why aren't they doing more to speak out? Yeah, do they think they're going to make a ton of money under an autocracy? Nope. <laughs> right, and that's it's not going to happen. Right? So, like, everyone needs to be willing to stand up in the town square, and that's like I said, why I find you on social media so compelling because you're willing to stand up in the town square. Like, I'm sure you get a ton of shit, and you get. I assume I can say that on a podcast. Oh yeah, um, oh yeah. All right. <laughs> like, I'm sure you get a ton of shit, and like, you know, and like the other day I saw you, you were like, let me explain. What I was, and I was like, I don't even know what this is about, but you know, honestly, it's the people who like are giving her crap just need to see what it's like to stand up in the town square every day and speak out in favor of democracy. It's hard. It's no joke, but it has to be done. I mean, I brought my son into this country. I'm an immigrant. I chose to live here. I believe in the American experiment. I believe in democracy. And I believe that if American democracy falls, there's no place in the world you're safe from that. You're not like, oh, well, I'll just move to Sweden and it'll be fine. It won't be fine. If America goes the way of Hungary, it won't be fine for anyone. It doesn't matter where you live in the world. It's up to all of us all over the world to really fight for the values that we believe in. And so whether that's the Democrats, you know, working on redistricting, whether that's the FEC fighting themselves in court, whether that's you and your team at the Elias Group doing the work you're doing, which, by the way, I also think is God's work. So finally, what can we do? Us normal non-lawyer citizens, what can we do other than just voting for Democrats and people who believe in democracy? What can we do to uphold the system? So literally... People need to do what you do. People need, no, I mean that. I, I like, look, what I say to folks is not everyone has a town square. Everyone has a circle that they can stand up and speak to. That's right. And for some people like you, it turns out it's like hundreds of thousands and millions of people. But it didn't start that way, I it predict. It certainly I don't didn't. Know, <laughs> right? Like we all need to not avoid, the worst advice that I hate that people give is they're like, when you're at, you know, when you're at Thanksgiving or Christmas, you're at the dinner table, like don't talk politics. Like, no, mm-hmm. like you need to be, when you, when you hear someone say that they support Donald Trump, Don't shy away from it. Don't look away from authoritarianism. Don't think someone else will address it. Whether it is your clients, your customers, your friends, your family, your neighbors, stand up and say that we need to to have a functioning democracy where everyone has a right to vote and can have their vote counted. And that's why, you know, like I said, they need to do what you did. And they may not have the same like large audience that you do, but it doesn't matter because if we all stand up and say, it's not okay, what Donald Trump and what Kerry Lake and what the Republican party are trying to do is not okay. If we all do that, then I think we'll succeed, but people can't be afraid to do that. No, they can't. And you, you, like you said, everyone has their own town square. And we say this all the time. You are responsible for your people. And whether that's your people at the dining room table or your people that do your hair or your person that you talk to at the grocery store, you are responsible for your people. And that's an extended group of your people. And the thing is, is that people shouldn't feel bad about not talking about politics. We have been trained our entire life to not talk about politics. We were told, don't talk about politics, don't talk about religion. And what are the two things that cause the biggest problems in the history of the world? Politics and freaking religion. So <laughs> So if we don't talk about it, that then it's only the people that benefit are the people in charge who want us not talking about it because then they can do That's whatever right. they want because we're not paying attention. And we have to pay attention. And that starts with saying to your granny across the dining room table, actually, and just being there with 
curiosity, with compassion, and with reality and with facts. And honestly, you can change hearts and minds one day at a time, and then exactly. the big things make a difference. Precisely. I want to thank you for joining us today, Mark. I was saying in the introduction that this is my last episode before the break, and I can't imagine closing off the year without a dedicated conversation about democracy. At the end of the show, I was telling you, I always thank people for caring enough about democracy to be here, and I'm so pleased that you were the one who was here to do that with us today. Well, thank you. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. So that was Mark Elias, Democratic super lawyer, reminding us that democracy, as he says, is on the docket. That from the Republican AGs being all in to throw out votes in 2020, to Arizona's current election denialism, to a focus not on conservative policy, but on conservative justices, to the very case of Moore v. Harper itself. We can't pretend that the Republicans aren't all in for minority rule and the retention of power not through democracy, but through the undermining of it. Mark encourages us to speak up for democracy, that its health and well-being belongs to all of us, that we all have our own town square to make our voices heard in its defense. I want to thank Mark for joining us today and you for caring enough about democracy to be here. Now go out and make the world a better place. Happy holidays, my friends. Until next year, PG out. The Politics Girl podcast is written and performed by me, Lee McGowan, in partnership with the Midas Media Network and produced and edited by Happy Warrior Entertainment. All rights reserved.